get ready for the last episode or next to last episode of programming an adventure game in uh, C++. There isn't that much left to do simply because uh, we've already programmed the first part of, um, of obtaining items and uh, making the game behave differently based off of those items, which is pretty much, you know, what you would uh what you would need to get yourself started i mean after this it's all just you know adding more content so let's go ahead and get started on making the key item that we implemented last time actually work and uh we're going to go ahead and make that work let me go ahead and fix this last time i had the font size a little small sorry about that guys uh yeah let's go ahead and get the get to work on making the um the scn files um uh, have conditional content based off of whether or not you have certain items so if you'll remember, uh, what I did was I added to SCN4 an item directive for the key. What I'd like to do is change the content of certain SCN files conditionally based off of whether or not you have an item. And we're going to use that item index or ID, which in this case is one, to, um, to, to, to make that distinction. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to go ahead and go to the one place where, well, there's two places, I might make it three, where having the key will actually change what you see. The first and foremost is if we go to scene four, I'd like the narrative not to say there's a key on the ground if you've already got the key. Uh, it would make sense for me to uh, have that maybe spit out something else uh, if you grab the key. So um, I've kind of tried to think about how I would make this work. I think the simplest way would be kind of almost like the way an if statement would work in, in a programming language. Basically having something along the lines of saying conditional item one. And basically what this means is that this will only run if you have the item. And then basically some kind of an, <laughs> this is ridiculous, but an else and then an end conditional. Um, it kind of looks like basic. <laughs> But uh, the idea here is I could I could make this easy on me parsing to only run um, certain things based off of whether or not uh, you have you have the item. I don't know if I really like this being else, but it's fine. Uh, it's not the end of the world. Um, I mean, I could put if here if I really wanted to. Um, maybe I will. Ah, fuck. But I don't want this to be thinking of like it's a general programming language. Um, but it's fine. I'll just make this if whatever. Like it's conditional makes no damn sense. Nobody wants to type that. Uh, so here we go. We have a damn if statement in our SCN file. Um, we're going to go ahead and make that work with our parser. Um, and basically, if you have the key, I'm just basically going to say, there's nothing here. You're stupid for looking at the ground for no reason. Okay. So how do we implement this? Well, it seems like it'd be hard, but it really isn't going to be that hard. Uh, the basic gist is I'm going to have, while I'm in my parsing loop, um, kind of like a global state that tells me whether or not um, I am in a conditional. And that conditional will basically have some information. And I'm going to store all that inside an int. I'm basically just going to say inside if item. And I'm going to set that to... Uh, I don't have zero for an item, so zero is fine. It's basically something that says that we're not inside of, an, of any kind of a um, conditional. Um, now, that'll basically be a flag I can set so that when I'm parsing inside, I'll know that I'm inside item one. Uh, there needs to be an else here, and, and that basically needs to be a flag to tell me that uh, I'm, I'm, I should only run these statements if the opposite of the if statement is true. So I haven't really left the if statement yet. And that's simple. I'm just going to have a bool here that says inside else. And um, that'll basically be enough for me to get started. So we're going to treat this like any other conditional, believe it or not. And that seems a little weird, but it's going to work just fine. The basic idea here is I'm going to make this the very first thing we check against, not that it matters. If the directive is if, <laughs> um, then we know that we are inside a conditional. But there's only certain kind of if statements we're going to handle. And those are going to be called subdirectives. And subdirectives will be parsed in as the very next thing after the if. So basically, we're going to read that in from the stream. And then um, we're going to check that subdirective is equal to item, which is our item subdirective. Then we're good. If we find out that the subdirective is not equal to anything, 
Um, this may or may not get me into trouble, but I don't think I need to do anything here except put an else. In this case, uh, it's an unhandled directive. Uh, and that is set to this. And error is true. And we break. In this case, uh, we have read up to the fact where we got items, so we need to know which item we're in, and this is pretty simple. We just say inf, uh, we extract from the stream the inside if item, and we make sure that it's greater than zero, um, which really uh, we would just um, be okay. Let's think here. I'd like the reset inside else to false here, just in case I had some mistakes I made in other places. So if this is less than or equal to zero, this is a uh, error. And we follow the same error handling is for. So once this happens, we're inside of an if statement. Um, the basic idea here is that all of the conditionals now that follow will be completely ignored if we do not satisfy the condition of us having item one. So um, this is pretty easy to handle. The idea here would be um, we would need to ignore um, known directives, but we, would, we don't just want to ignore them. For example, if I read this directive image, and I, or narrative would be a better example, and I decide that, oh, I don't have item one, so I'm just going to skip the rest of the code, then it won't parse this, and then it'll screw up the whole parser. So I actually need to let this thing completely read through all the entire uh, stream extraction, but I need it to essentially not apply the code or not actually finish processing the directive um, if the if statement is false. So here, I'll give you an example here inside image. Um, Unfortunately, at this point, as soon as we extract image, um, it's kind of too late. So we're going to need to uh, modify this code to kind of have a temporary here, um, uh, which I might just call i for lack of a better variable name. And the idea here is that we don't apply i um, this could be zero. We don't apply uh, ims. We don't set ims equal to i unless we're sure that we're, we're, it's safe. And I don't want to necessarily be passing the same if statement everywhere. I might use a local lambda to check to see if we're safe. But for now, I'm just going to type this out. Uh, the idea here is if we are inside an if item, and the way we check that is if this is greater than 0, and we are not in the else, well, first, let's do this. So if we're inside the if uh, if item, uh, shit. So if we're inside the if item, then it's safe to be to apply them. So in sort of in order to actually make these if statements work, I need to determine from the scene uh, whether or not we have an item in the inventory, and that poses a, a kind of a problem because I don't have access to the game loop at all from here. And um, I need to basically get that all the way from an argument to the constructor in order for me to do this. So I basically need to add a game loop argument to the constructor in multiple places to make this work. Um, so I'm basically adding a game loop as an argument to the constructor and then also as an argument to load scene. Um, that will help us It'll help us determine whether or not an item's in our inventory, because we need to know that from our parser. Um, and I need to also expose that as a method right here uh, inside game loop. I need to have a bool has item. And uh, really, at this point, I can just use the item index as, as the query to determine whether or not I have an item or not. So this will be a method that I'll need to implement. I'll put this right underneath my add item method here. And basically, I'm just going to search through the item inventory one by one. And then I'll return true if we find an item that uh, equals the item index that we're searching for. Otherwise, if we don't find it, we return false. Um, that'll really help us out, because now when we're going through the, uh, the scene uh, parser, 
and we're inside the if statements, we could determine whether or not um, we need to execute some of these directives. So what is it going to look like if we uh, want to um, handle or conditionally um, execute these directives? Again, it's important that I parse them, but I don't apply the changes uh, that they make um, to the actual uh, scene if the if statements uh, are not satisfied. So the simplest case is we basically need some kind of Boolean to tell us whether or not we can run uh, the directive. Uh, in the simplest case, it would be that we're not inside an if, an, if, uh, an if item. And the basic idea here is that this will be less than or equal to zero if that's the case. So again, it's like I have this inner desire to get these flipped. I don't know why I put that not in there. Uh, so that's one case. If, uh, if we're not inside an if at all, we definitely run it. Or, right, we are inside an if, right? Um, and there's no else, right? Because that would be a big deal. Um, so we determine that we are inside an if statement. We're not inside the else case. And um, we have the item. So game loop. I could have sworn that was an argument to this thing. I just didn't put it here, I guess. Hold on. This thing's trying to fight me today. All right. So that's our second case, right? And the third case is, um, uh, this is ridiculous. L let, let me break this out. I mean, sometimes you just got to opt for code readability instead. Um, I don't, I'm not trying to make this impossible to read here. Okay. That's way, way better. Okay. So, we are not inside the else. But we do have the item which really just comes down to run is equal to equal to us having the item. Otherwise, we're in the else clause, which means we only do it if we don't have the item. And in the case where this is not true, meaning we're not in an else, else if or we're not in an else, then we just stick with whatever run was before, which is um, the fact that we are not in one of these at all. So. Uh, this is basically this run stuff. This is too much to be pasting inside every single directive. So I'm going to break this out into another local function here, uh, another Lambda function. And this is basically going to be called can run directive. And this is going to be a function that returns a Boolean based off of some global state here. Um, these, I'd like this to actually be a little bit lower so I can use these uh, variables that I declared up here. And I'm basically going to pass those in again by reference, um, which is fine, or capture those by reference so that the function can access the outer state. Um, let me see real quick. Basically, what I'm going to do here is just return run. Let me see if that builds. Um, that is a constructor issue. I'll fix that later. OK. So our little can run directive function will be really nice because now all we really need to do is just call that to determine whether or not we can apply each directive. So if we can run it, which means the if statements and everything um, line up, we set mg equal to i. And we're going to do this for everything. So again, uh, we parse the item in completely, extract everything off of it, but we do not actually add the item unless we can run it. We're going to do that for narrative as well. Um, we extract the text, but we do not set narrative equal to it unless the directive is safe to run. Now with links, um, yeah, same thing. So here. And we'll need to do this for any future directives we add, at, at least if they're future directives that we want to make sure um, can, uh, what's the word, um, can be work properly within an if, if and an else uh, in our code. It's complaining about this. Doesn't matter. Okay. I think we're ready to test this. Let me just look. Narrative, narrative. Whether or not you add the item, the else. Let's just give this a try. I might have missed something here, but it doesn't hurt to just give this a try. 
So this thing's complaining because I need to now pass myself in when I make instances of the scene, the first argument to the new constructor. And I'm pretty sure that I do this in another place. So let me just take care of this. Okay, so let's see what happens if, um, if we run this. So I go into here, I go into here, I go down. It crashed because it says we can't parse because I guess I screwed something. Oh, I didn't handle, I didn't read out of the else's at all. That was really dumb. So, yeah. I need to uh, handle the, uh, the else and I need to handle the end if. Uh, so let's handle that really quickly. So this is more of our fancy makeshift uh, flow control. Basically, if we encounter an else, we need to be inside of an if. Uh, if we're inside of an if, then we flip the inside else to true. If we were not, then we just wrote else for no reason, which makes no sense, and that's a syntax error. Um, now we handle end if. I could put end if together, but um, it doesn't matter. Uh, basically, the whole idea here. Uh, is that I just want to extract out the part that says if to make sure that we're ending um, an if statement. Uh, so this is pretty simple. Um, I guess it wouldn't hurt to call this again subdirective and make this uh, follow a very symbol. Sim this is that was stupid. I didn't need to do that string start out empty by default. I just wanted this to follow the same flow control that I had for going into the if statement. Um, whoops. So, and if means we are no longer inside of an if at all. Or an else for that matter. Perfect. Let's see if that works. My guess is no, it probably will fail. Oh no, it worked. So it says there's a key on the ground, perhaps it has some purpose. I'm gonna grab the key and leave and I'm gonna come back and it says there's nothing here. You're stupid for looking at the ground for no reason. Now you will see the item does appear. Uh, and beyond, uh, this is really fun because we actually get to fix this without coding at all. The only reason that item appears is because this stuff right here should be moved into the else clause so that we don't add the key to the scene unless uh, we don't have it yet. Check this out. This is where it's really cool to be able to do this kind of stuff. So there we go. Grab the key, come up, go back. What do you know? It's not there and it cannot be grabbed again. And that works perfectly because we got our if else if stuff working in our SCN file. So I'm proud because that's really cool. Uh, so let's do some more things based off of whether or not you have the key. The funniest thing I'd like to do, no, forget that door, we're not worried about that yet. There happens to be a drop off ahead. Uh, it's pretty steep. If you go ahead, you die. It basically is like, oh god, your knee cracks on the rock and your head breaks open and you die. Um, this is like one of the death scenes that can happen. <laughs> it's pretty cheap. I mean, like, I did warn you there was a drop off, but this is one of the one of many ways like you might be able to die in an adventure game. And I don't have any links back. So at this point, like the user would have to just quit out if I had like a menu or whatever. Uh, because I think it would be really funny, I'd like to add an else clause into that so that I actually change the narrative based off of whether or not you have the key. Uh, and the basic idea here is, um, I don't know why, this is like just an insult to injury. But basically what I'm gonna say is um, the key in your pocket stabs your leg as you fall. <laughs> uh, so that's basically what's going to happen. You're only going to see that if you have the key. Um, another like much better example, uh, less troll, like more, you know, less like actually would make sense. Maybe if you had some item like uh, a rope climbing kit or like a mountain climbing kit. Um, I just want to see if this works. The key in your pocket stabs your leg <laughs> as you fall. All right, that's funny. Um, but yeah, it would actually make a little bit more sense uh, if I had an item that was maybe like uh, a rock climbing kit 
And if you went to image six or, or scene six and you didn't have it, you would die. But if you did, maybe I would like say, show a different image, right? And then I would say, you proceeded down the mountain safely. And then I would have a link in here to like a secret area. Um, that, that would be a perfect example of how to do this kind of stuff in an adventure game. So maybe like what I would do is there, there's a, a building ahead of me where the door is locked and you need the key to get in. Maybe inside that building, there would be a room where you can get the rock climbing kit and then they'd have to go all the way back to scene six, you know, and then inside this narrative where you die, I would give them a hint and be like, you know, you're really dumb for, for trying to scale a side of a mountain without a rock climbing kit, you know, and that would tell them that they need that. So that would be a perfect way to add like a much more elaborate interweaving uh, multiple threads into this adventure game. That's why I love these kind of games. It's so fun to be able to do this. But I don't want to get too far into content. I wanted this tutorial series to be more about the programming. Uh, everything I just told you, you would be able to do without writing an additional line of C++ code. It would all just be SCN files and, 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 and rendering scenes and adding new artwork. And that's what's really cool about this. So let's go ahead and do the, the last part of this, which is going to be allowing you into the courtyard by opening the door. So if you go all the way here, I'll show you in the game. So if you go all the way forward, there's a door and it's locked. Um, essentially, you can't really do anything because uh, the door is locked. So um, there's a couple things I could do here. I could make it so when you click the door, I could link back to the same scene that just had a message that said the door was locked. Or I could kind of maybe just more simply here, I uh, just say um, uh, the door is locked. And that's just kind of a way for me to just do that right here. And the basic idea here would be if you go to this scene um, and the uh, you have the key, I'm going to load a different image and I'm going to have a completely separate set of links and everything. Um, remember in the beginning I had the idea of alternates and stuff like that? It started to kind of seem like a, <laughs> that wasn't necessary because I can just load in a completely different image. Um, but it doesn't hurt for me to maybe kind of follow that lead so at least the image n names uh, link up to the um, the image names at least link up to the scene file name. So I'm okay with this being scene 7B. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, and do it that way. So we need uh, the ability for this to handle alternates here. Um, it's a little tricky because uh, it may or may not be there. Uh, what I'm thinking of maybe doing here is um, I got to think about this. So alternates are integers, which are useful. So I already have code that handles alternate as an integer in my init function, I believe, um, right here. And I do call init when I'm done parsing, which is good. Of course, I pass zero in for the alternates. Again, I had this mechanism in here where I was thinking I was going to have the items come in through init. I ended up not doing it that way. It's not the end of the world. But I'd like to keep in with the idea of alternates. Um, I think what I'm going to do, because the image doesn't actually load until the entire SCN file has been parsed, I think I'm just going to add a directive in here that says alternate, and that'll set the alternate, and that'll change the, uh, the image to the B one. So that's probably what I'm going to do. I'm just going to have this called alternate. This will be zero. And then when I call init, if I can find it, I pass that in as the second argument. Alternate on its own is a really terrible name, so maybe I'll just call this image alternate or alternate image. Right. And then the idea here is in the same vein that I handle parsing in the image, I'm going to handle parsing in the alternate in a completely separate directive. Uh, I could call this whatever I want. Uh, alternate image is a little long to type, so I might just call this alternate. It's You can rename this. It's not the end of the world what you call these. I'm just thinking off the top of my head here. Uh, but the idea is if you can only, only if you can run the directive do I set the alternate image equal. And it cannot be zero. It starts at one. I'm pretty sure of that. So there's my alternate thing. Uh, that's been implemented. It should be as simple at this point as me just basically saying uh, if I have item one, then I load in the first alternate, which is the B image. And then I end if. Notice I don't need an else if clause here, at least not yet. Um, and that 
we'll load this one in instead. Only if uh, we do it. Now, I guess I will need an else if simply because um, I'm going to need different uh, narratives. So, but it would have worked without one. I'm going to change this. I'll come up with something cooler there someday, maybe. Um, this is kind of dumb, simply because the, the door might be kind of already open when you get there. I'm starting to not like that, but it did work. Um, the only other way I could think to maybe do that would be to have a completely separate scene for this that you would click on when you go to the door. I don't like the idea of the door just like being open automatically. Uh, let me open up GIMP and, and, and play around with an idea here real quick. I'll edit this out if this turns out to be not worth it. So here's scene seven, right? There's the door, 570. So let's check this out real quick. Let's suppose here for a second, link. Five seventy three twenty three. One fifty six two ninety one. Is that two or yeah, two ninety one. So what I'm thinking of doing here is kind of having like some weird other alternate scenes that really have no purpose except to show you a different narrative. So in other words, I might do something like scene seven locked SCN. Um, and what that'll do is, yeah, I like that way better. Okay, so hold up here. We're gonna, we're gonna play around a little bit. Scene seven locked. Scene seven unlocked. Okay. Okay. So I go to scene seven locked. The only thing scene seven locked is gonna do you don't have the item, so there's no way you could get to the scene seven locked if you did. So uh really all I need to do at this point is <clears throat> load in image seven, which is the same image we already had. I could add some special code to check if it was the same image and not bother loading it twice, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, but the basic idea is here, I, I want this to say nothing more than is locked. Um, so this is where you end up if the scene is, uh, if the door is locked. And I don't even give you an option to click it again uh, at this point because you've already read that narrative. And then if you go into the one where the scene is unlocked, it's guaranteed that you have the key. I add the link, but this time the link would go to scene eight, which is the one where we're inside the courtyard, like this. Okay, right, so now I got scene seven locked, I got scene seven unlocked, and then the original scene seven If we have the key, it does not load the alternate <clears throat> yet, but if you click the door, we'll unlock the door. I have no idea if this is gonna work. I do know that I need to add these two uh, things uh, to Xcode. This is not exactly how I planned to do this, but um, it's, uh, pretty cool because um, I'm trying to kind of reuse all my SCN stuff to see what I can you know make happen here so let's see what happens if we go without the key so I forgot to add the mouse cursors here uh, which are pretty important in this case so let me go ahead and add those 
If I wanted to, I could set those maybe equal to the item cursor instead, but it doesn't matter. The idea here is once I, oh, this should not be up. This should be forward, damn it. Um, the idea here is that you could go forward through the door maybe, so that's what I'm using for the mouse cursors. So I click this. This is something about this. If I click to here, it says the door is locked, and now you can't do anything except go back, which is exactly what I want. Now I'm gonna go here and grab the key and see if it behaves differently. So now I have the key. Now I was able to open the door by clicking, which is awesome. And we should be able to go inside if I had gotten the link right here, which it looks like I didn't. So let's check out why that happened. So scene seven unlocked is supposed to have a link. Again, I screwed up this. This should say forward. And <laughs> this should be the entirety of uh, the the adventure game as far as programming is concerned. Because at this point now, we can implement tons of conditional stuff and tons of things just based off of grabbing items and have all these alternate paths. And that's really cool. Um, you could do a couple other things like, you know, maybe having streamlining a little bit more about opening doors and stuff like that. But honestly, like you could, you could do everything just with what we wrote. Um, again, like I said last time, uh, I'd like to add some music to this, but it's not the end of the world if I don't. Uh, and then I could add some directives to change the songs, you know, and stuff like that. But for the most part, this, this is basically how you do it. Um, uh, we got everything we need um, to do the adventure game. Uh, I might add another episode for saving and loading, but again, that's, you have all the tools that you guys need to know how to do that. You could use an output stream to save your file to somewhere on the disk, and then you could use an input stream to parse your own save file back in. So, I mean, everything you need to do to do this adventure game stuff um, <laughs> is completely done. So, um, that's the basic gist of it, guys. Um, really thank you for watching, and uh, I'm stoked to be able to teach you, guys, teach you guys how to do stuff like this, especially uh, some of the less... Uh, more niche genres of, of games that are, you know, more old-fashioned, but in my opinion, more fun to make. So, um, there we go. Adventure R. Uh, I'll be providing the code uh, at, at the current state at the uh, bottom in the description like I've been doing. Goodbye.